Well, it's wonderful to be here, um, and it's a great privilege in this role, uh, seeing many different churches. Again, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, it was striking me as I was preparing this uh, how, um, how the way, how it's funny, a certain name or label can have depending on the context that we are in. I've been watching um, one or two programs uh, in that series, um, uh, uh, Britain's Biggest Warship. Has anyone seen that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's about um, these two aircraft carriers that uh, the government is procuring, um, and uh, it tells about life on these carriers, or on the first carrier anyway, in its early days as it works up in its development. Um, and it struck me that the Royal Navy played the most wonderful, wonderful blinder in naming them. They, they named the first ship HMS Queen Elizabeth um, and the second ship HMS Prince of Wales. And I couldn't help thinking, what government minister is ever going to cancel these warships? Um, I was in the Royal Air Force for many years, and it made me think maybe we should be naming our aeroplanes after Queen Elizabeth and the rest of the royal family. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, if I use the word mission, mission, what is your instinctive reaction to that? How do you respond to that word? Because it embraces so many facets of church life. Um, yes, uh, it might well mean um, financial and prayerful, perhaps practical support to missionaries working far away across the world or perhaps closer to home. Uh, yes, it might well mean social action in some way in our communities, blessing and supporting them in that sense. But it also means being willing to say something uh, about our own faith, to be able to articulate something about what Jesus Christ has meant to us and means to us today. As I say, I was in the RAF for many years as an engineer officer, over 30 years, and um, uh, to be honest, living out one's faith is difficult. Uh, living out one's faith is difficult. I recognize that, uh, and, uh, um, and I'm aware of it. Uh, let alone speaking out one's faith when asked, being willing to articulate something of the hope that we have. It's not easy. And yet, why does the church exist? Why are we here? Interestingly, um, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, hit that head on uh, a year or so ago. He said, first of all, the church exists to worship God in Jesus Christ. And I think that can be uh, applied in both a scattered context uh, and a gathered context. Gathered, we're gathered here on a Sunday, but actually in our lives, our Monday to Saturday lives, wherever God has placed us, we, we, we live out those lives as a worship to God, the way we live those lives, the way our lives speak about our faith, what we speak about, how we speak, how we practically act, the decisions we make, all of that is a worship to God. So whether scattered or gathered, there's something about worshiping God. But secondly, he said, the church exists to make new disciples of Jesus Christ. And he went on to say, everything else is decorationate. Some of it may be very necessary, useful, or wonderful decoration, but it is just decoration. And I, indeed, I note your own website. The, the strap line of your mission is knowing Christ and making Christ known. It encapsulates those two priorities that Justin Welby outlines. Knowing Christ, our worship of him but making Christ known, making Christ known as well. And I think all of this speaks of being willing if someone asks to share something about what faith means to us, not in a heavy-handed way, not in an inappropriate way, with sensitivity, with discernment, just having the ear of God the Holy Spirit in all of that, but in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, with our families and friends, with the clubs and organizations and networks that we're part of. Those places God has put us Monday to Saturday. Belief, after all, seems rather stunted, doesn't it, if we can't find a way to share the convictions that we have. Well, I think this passage can just perhaps give us a few pointers, and I would just bring out 
three particular points. First of all, we read in verse 27 that Philip was told by God the Holy Spirit to go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. The context is that Philip and uh, other disciples have been scattered. There's been a lot of persecution going on in Jerusalem. They've been scattered to the four winds. Philip has ended up in Samaria. And we read in the earlier part of this chapter, chapter 8, of great things happening in Samaria as people respond eagerly to the Word of God. We're told that they listen eagerly. We're told of um, paralyzed uh, people being healed. We're told of the lame being healed. We're told of other things. We're told of great joy. There's something clearly, tangibly, powerfully going on. And yet Philip is told to take this desert road. I think that's interesting. For the Jewish mind, the desert was seen for good reasons as a hostile place. It was a big step of faith for him to take. He could have said, Lord, what are you talking about? Can't you see what's going on here? Why on earth would you want me to go there? It's worth just clocking that, actually. I've been a, a Christian, I guess, 40-odd years, and almost, all, almost never, as I look back over that period, have I seen lasting fruit, either in a personal sense or indeed in a corporate sense, the churches uh, uh, that I've seen over the years, almost never seen lasting fruit without some step of faith, active faith, risk and trust. The two go hand in hand. Um, and that speaks of a willingness to be obedient and open to the nudge of God the Holy Spirit. And Philip heard and obeyed. And over the years, it's so easy, we can lose that, that edge of faith, particularly when we first believe, and, and it just seems quite sharp. I was talking recently with a senior Christian leader, and he was about to jump on a, on a plane to the United States where he was involved in a conference there, this was someone who had a strong heart for the gospel. And he asked for prayer. And he shared something quite deeply and quite vulnerably, actually, that I think will resonate with many of us. He said this. He said, Charles, uh, when I used to, uh, you know, 30-odd years ago, when I used to have to fly somewhere, um, and I'd, I was relatively new to faith, I would often pray, Lord, um, uh, wherever I'm sat on this plane, whoever is next to me, may there just be an opportunity, if we do end up talking, uh, if I get to know this person, just give me the courage to be able to share something about my faith, if that opportunity arises. He said that would be the active prayer. He said, actually, I'm conscious now. Almost my, my implicit prayer is, Lord, give me a quiet place where I can just put my head down, get my laptop out, and do a mountain of work that I've got to do. And he was just aware of God challenging him and saying, look, I want to bring you back to that place where you've got that edge of faith and courage to share. And maybe we can identify with the sense of a desert place, because the 21st century, let's be honest, can feel, and indeed in many respects, is hostile from a Christian perspective. It's a desert place. We no longer live in Christendom signs of that Judeo-Christian heritage that previously were woven into the fabric of our nation. I mean, those of us who are older here will recognize that in so many ways. Those signs are now diminishing all over, and it can be difficult to be open about our faith in such a culture. Indeed, again, let's be honest here, religious extremism, if anything, has made it much more difficult. There's a sense in which all religions, all faith, is tarred with the same brush in the eyes of many. We can therefore easily assume many good reasons for just keeping our head down, hiding our light under a bushel. And yet we've got to be careful about making assumptions. Um, uh, some years ago I attended uh, um, the prize giving or the, the uh, certificates at the end of uh, my son's university course and it was done in Durham Cathedral, and the chancellor of the uh, university at the time was Bill Bryson, the American author. 
and he, there was a packed cathedral, it had been going on all week, and he said, look, this is the way it works. He said, but we need to be careful about making assumptions. We need to be careful about making assumptions, he said, because uh, what happens is, is uh, men and women, they come up, and um, uh, as they come up, I shake their hands, uh, and I give them a certificate, and say, well done, and sit down. He said, yesterday, we had a young man, and he, 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 so he said it was about halfway through the event, and he came up, and I noticed he had two books in his hand. And I thought, what a blessing. This chap realizes it's a long, hard week, and he's just given me two books. And as I shook his hand, he gave me the books, and he said, Chancellor, these are overdue library books. Would you mind taking them back? <laughs> he said, we've got to be careful about making assumptions. And we need to be careful also in that same sense, because Philip could have assumed many things. He did have a thriving ministry where he was. He could have assumed that going into the desert was a waste of time. He could have assumed that the Ethiopian, who was effectively the Chancellor of the Exchequer to the Queen of Ethiopia, this was an important man, was never going to listen to him. He was a nobody. But if he'd been tempted to assume those things, he would have been wrong. Similarly, we can assume today no one would be interested in our story. Actually, do you know, research suggests that people are open to hear about Jesus Christ. They're open to a conversation. They won't necessarily agree with us. Very often they will take a different view. But they're open to a conversation. The vast majority are open to a conversation. Earlier, earlier um, the year before last, I had a sabbatical, uh, and uh, I went with my wife, and we, we traveled extensively for three months, and we prayed at the outset of that, Lord, give us great encounters. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. And I can't tell you, almost daily, some great, great conversations, and many of those had a faith dimension. We could assume that people will have a pretty negative view of Christians. Again, the research suggests that the large majority of people, people who would not share our faith, uh, actually have a positive view of Christians, have a strong sense of goodwill to Christians. Again, they might not agree with us, but on the whole, they think well. We could assume that our words will make little difference. Do you know, 50% of Christians today have heard about Jesus Christ from friends and family. Interestingly, something like about 40% of people in our society have never had a significant conversation about Jesus Christ. So that gives you the sense of possibility. This passage, therefore, encourages us to be wary about making downbeat assumptions and about how people will, be, will respond. Maybe it encourages us to be willing to take those risks of faith and trust. But the passage also highlights another assumption about the way people are brought to faith. See, we can assume it's all about us. We have to have the answer to every question. And it's good to have thought things through. But God moves ahead of us. He was working in the Ethiopian long before Philip got there. He told uh, Philip, that the Ethiopian was reading Isaiah and was clearly wrestling with its meaning. We read in verse 30 and 31, so Philip ran up to the chariot and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, said the Ethiopian, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. God goes ahead of Philip in this encounter and prepares the ground. I was leading a retreat uh, a while ago, and there was probably about 100 people in a room, um, a, a bit smaller than this. And there was just one chap sat about there. Nothing special about him, but as I was talking, I just felt the nudge of God, the Holy Spirit, saying, you need to talk with that guy. I found him out the next morning and said, look, I know this sounds a bit crazy, but I just felt as I was talking, God said, we need to have a chat. And he said, funny old thing, I was feeling exactly the same. In fact, I wanted to come and find you to have a chat. And he said, I don't know what I'm doing here. 
He said, I'm a closet atheist. But he said, it's the, as though God is not letting me go. And he was loosely part of a church, and the church had supported him in all sorts of issues and things that he'd wrestled with. And he just felt this was just an important weekend in his life to make a decision. And we had a very helpful chat. And I suspect that there was still much further to go in that journey of faith for him. But it was a great example for me of the way that God goes ahead of us. It isn't all about us. He's at work in our neighborhoods, those we meet in the various clubs and networks. He's at work at the school gates. He's stirring in the hearts of people who are behind us in the supermarket queues. He's in our places of work. Actually, he's already working in the lives of so many that are touched by the ministries of this church. We need to be careful about making assumptions that people are not interested. God goes ahead of us. But finally, there's a third thing we can glean from this passage. In verses 34 and 35, we read this. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. What I love about this is Philip starts from where the Ethiopian is at. Think about Jesus and his encounters he had with ordinary people. He simply spoke with people from the places that they were at, the issues that they were wrestling with, the concerns that they had, the unfulfilled hopes and dreams. There was a, a, a young person that I was talking with not so long ago. When I say young, she was early 30s, not been in church for a while, and I uh, bumped into her, and we were sort of doing the British thing and talking about the weather and so on. And I was sort of thinking, Lord, what's going on here? Where's this person at? And she said to me, Charles, do you ever have doubts? It came out of the blue, and I thought, that's where you're at. That's where you're at. And we had a really, really helpful conversation just about doubts. We don't often talk about that. And yet we need to. It was so helpful. And um, the result of that was she just started coming back to church and engaging once again with her faith. It doesn't have to be complicated, this. The gospel has the power to change lives. We don't need to pretend we have all the answers. We just need to be real, prayerfully wise and sensitive, saying something about our experience of faith, responding to people where they're at. This role is a huge privilege. I see a great snapshot of churches across the country from rural settings to urban and suburban set settings. And if anything, I painted a bit of a bleak picture at the start of this. But I tell you, there's something stirring, I think, in the churches in our nation, right the way across. Significant numbers of people attending Alpha courses, Christianity Explored courses, other outreach initiative and discipleship courses, street pastor movement, initiatives such as Messy Church, church plants, which you spoke about earlier, creative new ways of church, not necessarily meeting on a Sunday. Actually, churches working with their communities in all sorts of ways or inviting people in to coffee mornings and so on. But also, but also, the other thing I see is ordinary Christians, ordinary Christians, just being a little bolder about their faith. It's interesting, isn't it? The early church never prayed for protection. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for boldness. So, this passage helps us in lots of ways. It encourages not to assume it's a desert out there. People are more interested in faith than we may imagine. It encourages us not to assume it's all about us. God is moving in their lives. We just need to be willing to respond to where they're at. It encourages us to be a little bolder. How 
would we want to articulate what faith means to us if the opportunity arose? It might simply be on Monday saying, in response to the question, what did you do over the weekend? I was at church. Oh, how was that? Well, I actually found it very helpful. And then going on from there. One of the pastors of, the mega church, of a mega church in the U.S. speaks about the local church being the hope of the world because the light of Christ is transformative. What about you and me? How has faith made a difference in our lives? What does that hope look like for us? How has it changed us? And what would we want to share if someone asked us in response to that? My prayer is that each of you in this church would increasingly be channels of God's spirit, of that hope, the hope of Christ in the community and in the lives that you encounter through the week. Amen.